Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is Energy in America with me and Lou Pugliarisi. Uh, Lou is the president of EPRINC, which is the Energy, Energy Policy Research uh, Organization in Washington, D.C. It's a think tank on energy. And he talks to us every couple of weeks about energy, and, and we stay current on national and international trends and developments, news and events in energy. So welcome to the show, uh, Lou. It's nice to see your smiling face, even in the time of crisis. <laughs> well, it is a terrible time, you know, having to do with the national economy. Um, yeah, it's uh, good to be here. So let's talk about, you know, weather in, in view of all the, um, you know, deficit spending we've had over COVID. Uh, this country will be able to continue on its uh, green energy initiative. I mean, yeah, yeah, it, it, whoever, I mean, whoever the president is, uh, you still have to have the money to do it and query whether- yeah, not only that, I think the money. question is, and I am giving a talk tomorrow in Athens, Greece. Unfortunately, I will not be there in person. <laughs> I will be doing it in the virtual at the Hellenic Association of Energy Economists. That's and right. uh, I'm talking about the, uh, what does it mean to ban fracking? Although I think the Democratic administration, I mean, the, the president, the presidential candidate, Joe Biden, is not for a total ban on fracking. He is for a ban on uh, fracking on new leases on federal lands. But uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about is why do, you know, why do we, you know, the failure of the economics profession to kind of teach their students about, you know, cost-effective ways of doing things. People who come up with bans and targets and all these kind of wacky things actually that the state of Hawaii wants to do to HECA, why these are really a bad idea. But as part of that, I want to talk a little bit about the the issue of climate is a issue of global significance. So we're gonna show you some data here, which is going to show that even if the OECD, all those, you know, the relatively rich countries take their emissions to zero, right? Take their carbon emissions to zero. Think of a magical thinking that lots of environmentalists use already for their electric cars and their windmills. So let's say this magical thinking resulted in taking all of the industrialized advanced countries to zero. We would still have emissions which exceeded the level we had in 1995. So what I'd like to talk a bit how about- How is that possible? I mean, it doesn't it sound like a contradiction in terms. It's not a contradiction. If, if I go to I zero, then I'm the not thing. emitting anything, right? Yes, the OECD, but we live in a global world which includes more than the OECD, it includes something called the non-OECD, like China, like Burma or Myanmar, like Indonesia. How, so how, gonna, how big is the non-OECD world? In terms of emissions, that will be our last slide, I believe. Okay. <laughs> so, so, and so there are two, two forces that are out there. One is the the fascination, the preoccupation with uh, reductions in carbon over, over adaption, right? And this, you can see this in California. In fact, um, if you had, uh, Epic recently hosted a webinar called Keeping the Lights On in California. And you can see in that discussion, the issue of the fires in California comes up and, and we'll get to that. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is that if you're going to transition to these uh, low carbon or zero carbon fuels, uh, you need money to do that. It's not free. It turns out that yes, solar and wind is very low cost, but it turns out it's not free. Uh, it takes money to transition these world economies. And one of the problems we're gonna find out is that we don't have a lot of money. So let's look at what the severe budget constraints look like now that we have, we're going through the COVID-19 window. And so that's our first picture. So let's bring that up. 
So what this is, this is some data from, you know, a bunch of sources, the European Commission, uh, also the Trouble Asset Relief Program. And what I'd like to show you here, there's two aspects of this uh, slide here. First is the fiscal response as a percent of GDP. So everyone remembers the financial crisis, right? It wasn't that long ago where we overinvested in housing and that we had a collapse. That fiscal response for that was about 200 billion in the, in the US, about 1.3 trillion. Well, COVID, that's chump change compared to what we've had to do for COVID. For COVID, well, um, also, what, what we're not finished. We're not finished. So the estimate for the U.S. is going to be about 4.5 trillion when we're done. A additional or inclusive? Total, total. Okay. And for the European Union, about 1.3 trillion. And what that means is we're going to have a big budget deficit. And if you look at the budget deficit, how they are expected to rise by the end of 2020, you can see uh, as a the deficit, the total outstanding uh, deficit, the budget deficit of GDP is going to rise dramatically in the US, Eurozone, Canada, UK, but it's also rising in places like China, Korea, Mexico, and Brazil, okay? These countries are not as rich as the, Euro as the USA and the Eurozone, okay? but, and, uh, so that's that's, well, that's no, it's no surprise. That's no surprise. But I think what what is what's fascinating to me is the discussion. Oh, isn't this wonderful? We have this COVID nineteen. We have all this fiscal money. We can use it to transition to the fuels of the future, and the requirements of servicing this debt, and the requirements of the just the basic things we need to do to get through COVID. It suggests to me that that's going to be a very hard sell. There's going to be a lot of demand on resources for build uh, for uh, recovering the economy, for uh, basic welfare support, for uh, infra uh, infrastructure, infectious diseases, healthcare. We're going to have a lot of requirements. And well, let me let me ask you some economic questions here. Sure. So, so we're spending a lot more than we anticipated. We're spending a lot more on things that are a surprise, mm -hmm. um, COVID. And uh, we will continue to do that until, as you said, something over $4 trillion. Yeah. Um, what does that do to our you know, budget? What does that do to our, the rest of our government? I mean, is there a bottomless pit of money out there? There is it not a bottomless pit. Okay, I know there's this new monetary theory. I don't think we want to really get into that now, but it means that uh, lots of terrible things can happen if this is not managed properly. One is that uh, it could end up to be a big drag of the national economy and we could suffer lower economic growth. And some of that lower economic growth may turn out to come from the fact that we're going to have to pay some of this deficit. We can finance it, but we're going to have to start to pay it. And that's gonna mean higher taxes, more allocation of the country's wealth into repaying these, assets, repaying these loans and not into new, not necessarily into new capital formation, right? Yeah, that's pretty serious. That's and, pretty you know, serious, and, yeah. And then, you know, so you, it's not free. This it's $4 not trillion dollars is not free. We, Ultimately, we, have we will have to pay it back. We have essentially borrowed on resources, productivity in the future for, uh, you know, expenditures, consumption today. And I think if you go, now the good news is the recovery is underway, right? The, the recovery is underway. And if you look at the next chart. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that chart and I really wondered about that. So because now if you we, look at we the, have, we have uh, you know, this enormous, uh, number of cases that's growing beyond expectations, beyond any boundaries, really. Um, and and um, it ultimately, I mean, even if you say that there's some kind of recovery going on now, it's forced because we still have, we still have not 
dealt with the virus. And this well, has been I, the I, big that's, problem that's, this year. Yeah, that's a kind of different problem. I, I don't actually agree with that. I think that the death rate has come way down. It's coming down. Yeah, the case numbers are going up. If you look at the MedCram data, the Johns Hopkins data, particularly worldwide data, in Europe, France, and Italy, yes, cases are going up, but these cases are concentrated in younger people, in people with very fast recovery rates. So I, we're, we're, kind, we're going to get a vaccine. Uh, that vaccine is likely to be, start to make progress sometime next year, maybe even the end of this year. So I think the other interesting I want to show about the, if you look at the major uh, bubbles, which are the percent of peak to the trough, you know, so how high we were to the bottom. Of course, you have the Great Depression, 26.7%, you know, 29, 30, 31. Then you have the World War II uh, transformation of the military economy to the civilian economy. We had a pretty big drop there, 12%. It was a Pretty big recession, right? And then we bump along till we get to uh, the uh, troubled asset recovery program. We had a 4%. I mean, you know, the financial crisis of 2008 looks like chump change compared to this 10.6. I mean, 10.6% is a big drop. And that's what, we've, that's what we're probably going to experience. I think we had probably a retraction of 30% in the second quarter, a recovery of 30% in the third quarter with the, with the other things happening in the first quarter, we're probably by the end of the year gonna have a 10% loss of the COVID crisis, right? Yeah, but it's not over, Ru. I it's mean, not, the, it's not I, over, but let me just say- When I first saw the chart, I, I said to myself, how can you make this determination now? We're right in the middle of it. And we still have these cases. You can argue about how good or bad the numbers well, are. I'm just saying this is these cases. And, and we have not recovered the economy. I can tell you in Hawaii, the economy is in the toilet. No, but uh, the, and it must so be the Hawaii, same way Hawaii in other states. Not, but, but so Hawaii that is, bubble there at the end of that chart is yeah. really in process. And it yeah, could yeah, be but much, I, much I do bigger. Think, I do think we can make the case that the Wor that the worst of this is behind us. And so what is the nature of the recovery? Hawaii is a special case. It is largely a self- I, I wouldn't even say the worst is behind us, Lou. I think yeah. the worst is in front of us. We're in, we're in a second wave right now. And uh, you know, if you could step, I, step actually, I don't to the think future and look at that bubble you know, from six months from now, I think that bubble would be bigger and a year from now, much bigger. We're not, we're not nearly done with this. So I guess I would disagree that I, I think we could have the big debate going forward is, do we have a V recovery or a K recovery or certain sectors of the economy going to do very well and leave other parts behind? Is the when will we get back to the scrimmage line? And I think there's a good chance by the end of 2021, early 22, we'll be back to the scrimmage line. We're coming who, back now. Who is saying that? Data I, see, I mean, sure. I, 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 Trump would like to say it's over already, but Trump, who, is say, who is saying that? So I'm thinking if you look at the data from the major financial houses, the Federal Reserve, a lot of independent, uh, uh, you know, Department of Commerce, the Census Bureau, we have all this data and it would take a long time. I mean, we could probably spend some you know, some time going through different aspects of where the recovery is. Yeah, certain sectors are, are lagging dramatically. The tourism business, airlines, uh, gasoline demand is not recovering uh, fast enough. But other parts of the economy are starting to recover. Uh, oil prices have stabilized. They're up in the 40s now. Um, I think the case of Hawaii, I hate to say this, I think it's largely, not totally, but it's heavily self-inflicted. Okay. It's heavily self-inflicted. It's uh, tourism. You know, we have a mono economy. We still have a mono economy, and right, but you know, it's hard, I, it's hard to think... get tourism started again. And the I airlines, do. the airlines, are essentially firing many tens of thousands of people, like this week. Um, you know, all kinds well, of sectors are collapsing. Bankruptcy yeah, think, are I increasing. If we, if we can get the, some stimulus money in there, I think they can maybe bridge through. I, I do think the airline business, look, 
The question is, will real estate come back? Lots of these things. It, you know, we have some history of these things. It, we, things will come back. It's really the timing that comes back. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for us to do a session on the economic recovery. And uh, we, we can maybe do that next time when we have more data. But the question I'm trying to raise tonight is a different question, which is that you're likely to have Biden as the new president. A whole bunch of new uh, people are going to come to Washington and they're going to be very entranced with the idea of transforming not just the US, but the world to the new Green Deal. Maybe not the new Green Deal. Maybe we'll call it the Biden Green Deal, but that we're going to do that right. And that my, my you know, you know, but one thing, let me just offer this. I mean, yeah. when they come to Washington um, and they get involved in implementing whatever initiatives they feel are appropriate, mm -hmm. the first thing they're going to have to do is patch things up. They're going to have to attend to the virus. It hasn't been handled. They, they're going to have to attend to the economy. That hasn't been handled. They're going to have to try to fix the things that are broken. And Frank, I, and you may agree with me on this, Frankly, the new Green Deal is not the immediate problem. It is exactly. not, so I not just, on the top of the priority list. I can tell you, on the first, the first year of the Biden administration, environmental issues, for example, if you listen, I mean, I couldn't watch the debate. It was too, uh, you know, too horrible for words for me. But I looked at some of the transcripts today, and I would say that, uh, yeah, Biden is likely to do some stuff on fracking it, but I think it's going to be very limited. I don't think he's going to blow up the jobs in the oil and gas industry. I don't think he's going to, I actually don't even think he's going to take the, attach the tax rates the first year because the economy is going to be still pretty flat, right? It's recovering, but you don't put taxes in a year where the economy is down. That's going to be postponed. So as we've spoken before, I, my guess with Biden is he will spend a lot of time reaching out to American allies, to uh, taking down the tone of a lot of the rhetoric. That's going to be his big thing. I, I totally agree. And in this and, country too. And, and to try to settle things down and bring, bring down constituencies and we're, we're, together in this country. COVID. But I can tell you the notion that we should go through a further lockdown, that's over with. That's not going to happen. Nobody's going to do that. It's over with. The costs of that are too high of another lockdown. People are going to have to learn to deal with the risk of uh, COVID-19 within the framework of sending people back to work and back to school. Well, you know, that's just not, I don't think it's a black and white binary thing. It's absolutely not. I agree. And, and so you can have, um, you know, you can have a lockdown on one side, that's binary. You can yeah. have a completely open on the other side, that's binary. But the answer is somewhere in the middle. Um, yes, the course. answer is you, you tune it carefully, delicately. You tune it sensitive, you know, in great sensitivity to what is going on on both sides. And I mean, both sides of the economy and the non-economy. And, and I think that probably we have learned, hopefully we have learned something. And the next president, hopefully Biden, We'll be able to say, look, uh, let's get together on this. Let's develop some really refined policy in Washington, and all you guys can follow it. We'll have national systems, and that will be a much more refined approach. Right, but we live in a constitutional democracy, <laughs> which uh, with with a re with republic, a republican uh, yeah. democracy. So I wouldn't argue federal that federal government generally can take care of things by uh, by doling out money and issuing guidelines, it will not have the power to override governments, okay? It will just not have that power. Even Trump has learned that the hard way. Okay. So my, my point tonight is something else. I believe that you're going to have to rethink how you approach climate. If we go, and I, I, let's go to the last picture or the next picture here. And this picture shows you uh, that there's not going to be a substantial transformation in carbon emissions without the non-OECD world. And I think we all knew this. 
We just didn't want to talk about it. And so we just finished up the annual uh, produce, LNG producer consumer conference. I chaired a, a panel, this was all in the virtual world, on decarbonization. And we had Jeffrey Long from the University of California to talk about new uh, technologies to rapidly absorb carbon at much higher rates, um, the certification of net zero LNG, lots of ideas. But these ideas are largely costly, or at least more expensive than the current energy mix. And they're almost entirely taking place in the developed world. But if you look at this chart here, the red is the non-OECD emissions, which now surpass emissions in the, emissions in the OECD. And we talk to these we talk to people from these countries, power systems in places like Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, and uh, what they're saying is. We don't have any money for decarbonization. We don't have any money for massive research program to drive out the coal. Yeah, the China made a big commitment. India said some things. But this is the problem. Really, you know, legacy scale and technology is not coming in there nearly fast enough. And as we get to this post-COVID world, they're going to worry about how they keep the lights on. They're not going to have time to think longer term. So out of that comes the conclusion is we do need to keep pushing the research and the technology transfer so that the systems that are available to the world that are decarbonizing or moving to hydrogen are very, very low cost. They are going to have to be competitive with today's current fuels. So I, I just wanna put that out there as a big, big problem. And I want to respond with this. Um, it really is too bad that um, not only has Trump stopped the, um, you know, the climate change effort in his time, but he has, he has, he has slowed it down everywhere um, because, because the president of the United States is a kind of world leader, no matter how good or bad he is. And so that's one thing. The other, the other thing is, uh, you know, David Attenborough, the Sir David, uh, was on 60 Minutes with Anderson Cooper on Sunday. Um, and he made a very important point, uh, and that is the world has, has had tremendous damage to it. The planet has had tremendous damage. No, you know. That damage is increasing every day. And, okay. and at some point in the future, not very far away, we are all going to suffer. People will die for climate change. Already the storms in the Northwest, already and in the Southeast, um, and, and, and this will affect Hawaii, will affect everywhere. And the problem is you can say, well, we got to wait on this. We got to wait on that. A COVID or no COVID, this says we got to save the planet or the planet will eat us. And I'm very concerned about that. David so Attenborough, I actually, very concerned. I, I do the not. The natural world is collapsing around us. I, I think that's a much too apocalyptic, okay? And I understand among, particularly among the left in the United States. But when do you solve it, Lou? When, okay, you know, so here's my question. I have a very, a very at interesting. At some point, question. it's going to be a judgment day, and it's yeah. probably very soon. Right, but here's here's the problem. All the effort has gone into. We've talked about this before, and this came up in our discussion with the California officials, right? Well, um, you say the climate's changing. You say it's been changing for years. Then why did you have a program in California that put all your effort into jamming, you know, solar and wind and batteries, and you didn't do anything to protect the grid. You did nothing for adaption. You put everything into mitigation, and you said the climate was changing. You said it was changing. And you know that California cannot alter the climate. Maybe you could have a 1% effect. Then why did policymakers not put any money into adaption? They could have they cleared wrong. vegetation. They were that wrong. I'm not wrong. The expenditures on, on those policymakers were wrong. Yes, they were wrong. They were wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, it turns out some of the utility systems like uh, San Diego Gas and Electric did a pretty good job of building out the grid, 
taking out the underbrush. But once again, some of this is attributable to the environmental community, which says, oh, we can't have you cut the trees. We can't have you clear out the vegetation. We like the vegetation. You can't be a mean person and, and do that. Now, I think you, if you look what's happening now, people are getting the, you know, they're getting the message. Even the architects are starting to say, oh, this net zero house is kind of crazy. Let's build it with stronger catchments. Let's change the way we build the houses so they're more durable. Yes, we have to work on decarbonization, but we abandon adaption at our own, you know, at our peril. We have to put more money into adaption. But adaption is not sexy stuff. No one's giving you a Nobel Prize for figuring a better way to build a house so it's more adaptable. They want some technology. They want some fancy way to reduce carbon emissions. But I'm saying is that the, the history of mankind is all about adaption. By the way, the climate has changed before without carbon. It's changed many times. And so- I, I, This is the argument you and I have had over months yeah. as to whether uh, it, is, it is of a concern and it is of a concern. It's a concern, um, but guess I, what? And, and we, we can't really kick the can down the road. We have to deal with it one way or the other. So we can bicker about you know, exactly whether this plan is a good plan or that plan is a good plan. Um, those are political issues as far as I'm concerned. At the end of the day, we have to come together on, on recognizing that it's a big problem and it's gonna damage everyone in the world and we have to do something. And so- Let me ask you, if I went out to the American people today and I said, you think we're underspending in climate and overspending on infectious diseases? What do you think they would say? Um, I think our response on COVID-19 is a tremendous intellectual failure. You can blame it on Trump, but it goes beyond Trump. It's our academic institutions. It's our governments. It's everybody who thought, oh, we don't have to, if we worry about climate and nothing else, we'll just be fine. You know, the climate is the be all and end all of all things society should worry about. And we put all our intellectual resources into climate. We have starved the other sciences. We have no, not I, I, I certainly resources. agree we can't do that. We have priorities. We and we have to be smart about the priorities. Yeah. Climate, you can't be at the top of the chart right now because we don't have the money. But right. it can't be at the bottom of the chart either. It doesn't um, need to be at the bottom. We have to address it. It has to be part of everything we do, whether we spend the money in, you know, in this year or next year. We have to make plans and move down the road with it. If we ignore it, which we have been doing, um, you know, we are going to pray, pay a horrible price. First, I will send you it's the- It's not me, it's, it's, it's kids. It's the next generation. Yeah, but let me and, just say- If you ask them to make this policy, they're underinformed. Yeah, but I'm gonna send you the agenda of our recent event in which different uh, individuals, companies, research presented uh, papers and research. It's a mistake to say we've ignored it. Even the Trump administration is spending a great deal of money on decarbonization. You might find that quite shocking, but I will send I you. And uh, in the power sector, in cooperative programs with Japan on, on hydrogen, we have a very big program on hydrogen. It's just that these problems, if you get back to this last chart, you're going to have to make this stuff a lot cheaper. You can't just put on a hair shirt and say, I've done a good job. I've controlled the climate. I didn't need any mung beans today or something. It's not going to work, right? You're going to have real, need real breakthroughs and new technologies because the developing world is not going to pay for it. And if you don't get the developing world, you might as well just put all your money into adaption. Well, I, okay. Uh, but, I, but I come out at the end saying that I don't think the world is putting enough effort in, and thought into this. It's not collaborating in this. There, there are silly disagreements between this group and that group. A lot of people reject climate change in this country. Thank you for Dr. Trump uh, and many others. And, you know, and the problem I have with it is we are not together on the issue. We have not worked out the priorities. We have not made a plan. We have not collaborated on a, on a global scale. And we are, we are sitting pretty for enormous disasters and loss of life and the next generation is going to be too late. 
Um, so I, I agree with you. There are certain things that are more, prior, more higher priority, but we cannot forget this for one minute. You have to build it into everything we do, every policy we make. So if you if you want to see the nature of the challenge, let's look at the last picture here. Do we have one more picture here? Yes. Oh yeah, two things. We, we I, uh, for, first the next picture. We'll skip that the global primary. Let's just go because we're running out of time here. I just thought you might yeah just go. Let's take a look at the upcoming election. I know that's a, and I thought this is from the predicted market. You see. And this is the betting market. And I thought it was very interesting that um, you see the top light blue line, it's slightly above the dark blue line. So right now the betting markets are saying that we're most likely going to have a uh, Biden presidency, but a divided Congress. But it's very close to the outcome of a Biden presidency and a democratic Congress. So that's where the betting markets are right today. And so we are, it looks like we're headed for change. Let's see what happens here. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would sure like to see that. Um, I'm not all that I make no but... comments on uh, political <laughs> outcomes are bad for business for me to take sides. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very interesting chart, but I, I, I'm not sure I understand. Maybe you can take one moment, Lou, and tell us what the betting market is. The betting market is that there are markets in the U.S. and even abroad in Ireland where uh, people can bet money on the outcomes. They can actually buy like a paramutual ticket almost, like a horse race. And the thinking has been among economists that betting markets are more accurate than polling or what pundits tell you. Because in betting markets, people are betting real money. <laughs> and they don't, care about, they don't care about the candidates. They just want to make money. So you know, betting- <laughs> It would be great to, to- So who's going to win? Uh, well, we have that. This is the betting market is showing yeah. you who's going to yeah. win. Yeah. Okay. It could well, be wrong. You know, some bets don't come in like you predict. So that doesn't mean it just says the, these are the implied odds, right? And they change. They probably change. They change day, day to day. day. Yes, they change day <laughs> to day. And you can see the shift moving around. You can see it. You know. <laughs> That's very interesting. Well, I, I hope it works out something like that, you know, where at least we pay attention. Um, one way or the other, it becomes political because it involves money. Um, and we haven't solved the money. We haven't solved the political. And yeah, just let me leave. We solved the climate change. You know, and everything in life involves risk. Okay. And in my view, uh, the way the state of Hawaii, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but my view is, the weighing of the risks assume that the costs of the lockdown were more than acceptable to the cost of uh, increased number of cases and deaths from COVID-19. Yet we don't make those calculations when we build roads, or we let people drive, we don't do that, but we did it for this. And the risk of this, now we didn't know a lot in the beginning, but we do know something now. We have good international data. We know that it is not that lethal. It's bad, it's bad. But my, but I think further lockdown, and here's my prediction I'll make. If Biden becomes president, we will have no lockdowns. That's my prediction. There will be no lockdowns under a Biden presidency. You can take that to- And I would refine that to say, uh, the, it's more likely uh, if Biden becomes president, uh, we'll be smarter about lockdown. We might be smarter, but you know, in the end, you where I, I don't think he's going to do it. I think the it's going to become so apparent that the economic losses from the lockdown are just too devastating to bear. We're going to see. I hope we're going to see. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. But we're out of time. I, okay. I really enjoyed this. You a very stimulating conversation. <laughs> and, I, and I look forward to our next discussion. All right. Look forward to seeing you, Jay. <laughs> Take care. Lou Pudirisi, the president okay. of EPRINC in Washington. Thanks so much. Aloha. Aloha.